It's interesting, this past week when I came to the office on uh, Tuesday, I, I was fully ready to move to the second verse of, of uh, Psalms 91. But I felt kind of checked in my spirit about that, and so began just to read over verse 1 again and began to realize that there was something else there that I felt God wanted to, to speak to us about and share with us. And over the last couple of days, there have been a number of either things that I were reading or somebody texting me something or whatever that just encouraged me that this is the message for today. Now, I'm not saying God said. I'm just saying I was checked in my spirit about moving on too quickly from where we are. And so I want to begin this morning by asking you a question, and then I'm going to follow that with a whole series of other questions. Do you, here's the question, do you believe this verse? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that? Do you believe that God who was willing in Joel's day, to pour out his spirit upon all flesh is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that God who walked in the fiery furnace is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that the God who shut the lion's mouth in the den is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that the same God who asked Abraham to move to a new land is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe the same God who provided for Ruth and Naomi is the same yesterday, today, and forever? <laughs> Do you believe the same God who was with Esther is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that the God who raised Lazarus from the dead is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe the God who impregnated Mary with the baby Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe the same God that revealed himself to John on the Isle of Patmos is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Now, I know some of you are going, okay, already, enough with the questions. <laughs> and I know that you know where I'm going with this. Do we believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? That leads me to, back to Psalms 91, verse 1. Last week... I read to you the entire chapter because I wanted you to see what God has promised to those who will dwell in the secret place. Actually, the promises of this chapter are for those who are abiding under or in the shadow of the Almighty. And I believe our only safe, safety is in abiding in the presence of Almighty God. This chapter is filled with promises of God to all who will abide under or in the shadow of the Almighty. Just look at this list of promises from this chapter. He shall deliver us. He shall cover us. He shall be our shield. He shall give his angels charge over us. He shall not allow any evil to befall us. He shall not allow any plague to come near us. He shall give us long life or eternal life. He shall show us his salvation. We shall trample underfoot lions and cobras and serpents. And we shall call upon him and he will answer us. Please don't get impatient with me. But all of these promises are to those who abide under or in the shadow or the shelter of the Almighty. 
The presence of God Almighty, our shelter, our strong tower, and our very present help in time of need is the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I want to read from Psalms 91.1 again. And yes, I'm going to ask you to stand even though it's that one verse and most of you know it by heart by now, but I'm going to ask you to stand just in reverence to the Word and in honor to the Word. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall, and some versions say will, but shall abide under or really in is a much better translation, in the shadow of the Almighty. Father, this morning, once again, I'm asking, Father, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would be upon all of us to hear the word. Lord, you, we, we believe that you are the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And we know who you are. But, Lord, we step into situations and circumstances in our lives. And sometimes, Father, we have asked, where are you? But, Lord, today we're going to declare from your word that we're going to abide under the shadow. That, Lord, all that you have promised to do for us and in us and through us, that, Lord, we will accomplish that. So I ask, Father, this morning in the name of your son, Jesus, please, Father, help me, I pray. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. And you may be seated and thank you again for standing in reverence to, to God's word. And it's really warm, so I'm going to take my, my jacket off this morning. Whew. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. All of the promises in this, just in this particular chapter... We're not even talking about all the promises that are in the rest of the Word of God. Just in this one chapter, all of these promises are to those who dwell or live in, take up residency in the secret place or the presence of God. The promises of God are our shelter, they're our strong tower, and they are a very present help in time of need. Simply put this way, God will hide us in Christ. Many years ago, I met a man. He was at least six foot eight tall. He weighed at least 350 pounds. He was a bodyguard formerly for ACDC, that group, and then for Prince. He got saved. And he and I became good friends. And uh, at the time when we were doing Teen Challenge in Minnesota, I was also involved in jail ministry, and one of them happened to be the Juvenile Boys Center. And in my group, I had all of the kids who had gotten kicked out of all the other groups. So I had all of the kids who were not interested in God, they weren't interested in the Bible, they weren't interested in Jesus, they were just interested in breathing air. They could have cared less what I had to say or what I brought the truth of the Word of God to them, they could have cared less. So, one day, I said to um, Big Chick, I said, hey, would you go with me? His name, by the way, is Big Chick Huntsbury. Some of you may know that name. Many of you probably do not. I said, hey, would you go with me up to the juvenile jail? He said, oh, man, I'd love to go up there. Let's let's go up there. So, we got up there, and uh, the rooms that we use for our different uh, uh, classes and things were also their classrooms. And so we had to wait till class was out, and the the guys came out. And, of course, my gang happened to notice I was there. They weren't that interested in me until they saw Big Chick Huntsbury with me. And they came up, and they said, you know Big Chick Huntsbury? I said, yeah, he's my friend. (laughs) Wow. You know, I never had any trouble after that with them boys. We got in that room, and of course, all the rest of the group wanted to be in my group today. I mean, they, they, so all of the other classes got dismissed, and we found a room big enough and got in that, got in that place, and I, I didn't have to introduce him because they all knew more about him than I did. And he got up, and he looked at them boys, and he said, what a bunch of losers. You were stupid enough to get caught. You are really losers. Dumb. 
I mean, he just went, kind of went on for a few minutes, you know. And I thought, well, we're going to lose these boys real quick. This is, this is going to get over. And then he made the statement. And he looked at those boys and said, I once was a loser too. But he said, I came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in my life, and I'm not a loser anymore. And he presented the gospel to those boys that day. And there was a number of boys that prayed a prayer of salvation with Big Chick. And see, here was the deal. You see, those, those boys didn't give me trouble anymore because they thought I walked in the shadow of Big Chick Huntsbury. And if Big Chick could, could, could well, he can't anymore. He's passed on now. But he said, if he knew for a moment that those boys thought I walked in his shadow, he would be, he'd be back at him again. Because you and I don't walk under the shadow of some big guy we walk under the shadow of he who is the almighty God. Amen. Hallelujah. And I believe that there were men and women of God who lived under the shadow of the almighty, who served God when the odds were against them. See, it's easy to live for the Lord when everything is going your way. Amen? I mean, when everything is, you got money in your pocket and your bills are all paid and you can afford to go eat at whatever your favorite restaurant is and you can buy the clothes that you need and, and uh, everything, boy, that, that, you know, we're on top of it then. We praise God. But what about when the odds are against us? There's a lady in the Bible by the name of Deborah. She was a fearless patriarch. Though she had no children of her own, they called her the mother of Israel. She had opponents that came against her as she was the leader. A hundred thousand of them and her army was ten thousand. But she called upon the name of God. And God sent a hailstorm. And the enemy was defeated without a war. Because she lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Joseph, talk about the odds against you. All of his brothers hated him, not just like one or two. They all hated him. And, and, and he was lied about. He, he was finally put in prison and forgotten about. But he never failed God. And if you read the story of Joseph, you'll find out that no matter where all of this stuff that came against him was, he always rose to the top because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Daniel is one of my favorite Bible characters, and, and nowhere is it ever recorded that Daniel ever failed God. And he chose not to defile himself, though he could have made excuses and allowed that into his life. And when he came time, and the odds were against him, and he was thrown into the lion's den, the lions did not harm him because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. You know I like the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They held high places in government. And when they defiled the king's orders, the odds were against them because he was going to heat up the furnace seven times hotter than it had ever been before. No one was going to survive this fire that they were going to be thrown in. But they walked into that fiery furnace. They walked back out of that fiery furnace because they lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Do you still believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Amen. Elijah stood for the right when the wrong was popular. He seemingly was by himself against the, all the prophets of Baal, and the odds were really 900 to 1. But when he called down fire from heaven, the God of heaven answered by fire, because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Elisha, he could make oil in the bottom of a barrel, and it never ran out. He, 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 he left a very peaceful occupation and became a model of a spiritual leader because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Peter is a man who 
fell, but he rose again. And Peter's character was deepened and strengthened. His shadow, he had so come to live under the shadow of the Almighty that it so empowered his life that his shadow could fall on people laying on cots. He never laid his hands up. He never anointed them with oil. He never claimed or or went against anything. He just, his shadow falling on them changed their life and they were healed. Why? Because Peter lived under the shadow of the Almighty. John was a successful fisherman he, 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 was a, he, was, he had a prophetic zeal and a, a resolution to witness for Christ. He was trusted with the care of the mother of Jesus. When he was sent to the Isle of Patmos and all the odds seemingly were against him, he received a revelation of coming events because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Paul, as we've been studying on Wednesday nights, was converted on the road to Damascus. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote almost half of the New Testament. He started more churches probably than anybody else in the history of the church. And five times he received 40 lashes minus one. Three times he was beaten with rods. Three times he was shipwrecked. One time he was stoned. But here in the end, the danger was there upon him time after time after time. And he survived all that. Why? Because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's move up a little bit to our time. There's a man by the name of Charles Finney. If you haven't ever read his history, I I challenge you to do that. Because the presence of God was so strong upon him that people repented without him preaching. The story is even told of walking into a factory one time, and as he walked by and was walking through, the men just began to fall on their knees in that factory and began to confess and repent their sins of their sins. Do you know why? Because Charles Finney lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Charles Wesley pastored a great church. In fact, he was the founder of the Methodist Church. And just in case you're wondering, most of the other denominations that have ever been started all started just like the Assemblies of God under the inspiration of the power of the Holy Spirit. They all believed in that, but they let it get away from them. Charles Finney, sometimes there were people who would come to visit this great cathedral that he preached in. And people would say, where where does the power come from in this church? Where's the power? And he would take them down into the basement of that church. And down in the basement, there was a prayer room. And he would find at least 400 people praying to God down there. He preached about personal holiness. He helped spark the great awakening because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. D.L. Moody preached the old-fashioned gospel. I like that. Emphasize the little interpretation of the Bible. He probably preached to at least 100 million people. He proved that science and God were a match because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. Billy Graham, there's a name that you'll know, preached in, in person to probably every, more, than, more than anyone else in history. He held crusades all over the world, and it is reported that somewhere about 215 million people confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior because of his preaching. Why? Because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. One of my heroes, David Wilkerson, he was considered Pentecostal in his teaching and in his practice. We know, you know the story pretty much anyway, I trust, that he went to New York City to evangelize teenagers who were involved in drugs and crime and gangs, and he started the Ministry of Teen Challenge. He received prophetic insight that many of us have read those books, and we, we realize that even though they were written a long time ago, we're now living in those very times of which he predicted this would happen, especially in America. And why was all of that? Because he lived under the shadow of the Almighty. 
Now, I've only scratched the surface with these names, but they have set an example for us. And that is where I believe God wants us to dwell and abide under his shadow, under his presence, which really means abiding in the anointing and in his glory. Abiding under the shadow. Speaks of one who stays in the presence and the anointing of God. By, by communion, talking and listening, building a strong relationship and understanding of the covenant. See, abiding under the shadow is by that constant desire to be in that secret place. The person who abides there is an inspiration of hope an anticipation, and a yearning to draw and stay close to the Almighty. Abiding under the shadow is more than a goal. It is a destiny. It is an ambition to dwell in that secret place. See, the aim of those who want to abide under the shadow is not just going to church once a week or just doing daily devotions. Their aim isn't just fasting. Their aim isn't just sharing with their friends uh, their faith with their friends. It isn't just uh, giving a tithe. It, it, isn't more, it is more than just volunteering for ministry. No, their aim, their ambition, their initiative, and their motive is to live under the shadow of the Almighty. Abiding speaks of one who trusts. Live, we live in the confidence every day. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did back here, he can do today. What he can do today, he can do in the future. So I don't walk in fear of the future. There's no fear about the future. Why? Because God's the same yesterday, today, and he will be the same in the future. The trust is there. It, it, the, the trust is so there that I let God lead me every day. Labors in the ministry of reconciliation and pardoning and the redemption of the, uh, of the Almighty. There are persons who become a partner with Christ in ministry. See, God's secret place means dwelling in the secret place of God's Word. It causes us to abide in comfort. When there's unrest in our life, we need the book. When there are things going on in our life that we can't understand, we need the book. When, when, when answers aren't coming the way we think they should come, we need to get to the book. And it'll cause us to abide in a comfort. And our minds become fortified with God's thoughts and ideas and principles and promises. See, God's secret place means dwelling in the secret place of God's communion. It causes us to abide in prayer. It is the place where our whole nature or our character becomes magnetized to the nature of Christ, and it causes us to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks for the circumstances we're in. Hmm. You see, God's secret place means dwelling in the secret place of God's love causes a, our, our lives to live under the protection and the influence of God's love, abiding under the intense feelings of a deep affection for God. And we abide under the value of, that God has placed upon us. See, when we begin to live and under that shadow of the Almighty in His love, what we begin to understand is, I'm very important to God. Nobody else may care about me, but he does. No one else may give a rip whether I'm there or not, but he does. You live in that, and there becomes a deep affection inside of us because we understand he, we are important to him, and now he is important to us. Hmm. You see, God's secret place is dwelling in the secret place of God's purpose. Causes us to abide with, with his pursuits and his interests and his intentions and his energies, engaging us in cooperation of God's total will for our lives. I, I'm going to mention three things about abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. It is a place of peace. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
They do not bring peace. They are the peace. So to be in peace, we have to have or be in Christ. First, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ. Romans 8.1 says, Therefore there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. See, when we are in Christ, there is a peace that passes all understanding that keeps our hearts and our minds stayed upon Christ. Number two, it's a place of purity. When you think of purity, when it comes to our minds, it's being clean in our attitudes, our motives, and our desires. We're being purged from our idolatry and our jealousy and our factions and our hatred, etc., etc. And we're being filled with a love, being filled with a joy, being filled with a peace. Why? Because we're dwelling, we're abiding under the shadow of the Almighty, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe God's desire is for us to be in relationship with Him so that we would have an intimate relationship with Him. This chapter is filled with promises to those who abide under or in the shadow and in an intimate relationship of the Most High. Let me explain what I'm trying to say here. God wants for us, too, to have an intimate, agape relationship with Him. We get that by dwelling in that secret place and abiding in a covenant relationship in Christ. When we speak of an intimate relationship, we're speaking of that agape relationship. Now, the word agape does not mean unconditional. It means a value-creating love. And so our relationship is where we place value upon God upon Christ and upon the Holy Spirit. See, an agape relationship is one where we are open to the wonder and the surprise of what God is going to do next. Some of you are afraid of what God's going to do next. (laughs) We live in that anticipation. What's God going to do next? We just can't wait to see what he's going to do next. And that agape love involves feelings for God and that we put him before ourselves with wanting to dwell and abide with him. See, agape is where a person makes a commitment and a vow to live in that covenant relationship in Christ. There there is an engagement to him, a belonging, a believing, and a becoming in our lives. See, agape love represents a form of love that is everlasting. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's not going to change his love about you for tomorrow. Hello, somebody. He's not going to change his love for you. It's what he loved you before you came to Christ. He loves you now you're in Christ. He's not going to drop you tomorrow. He's still in love with you. And he wants us to be in love with him. See, that love represents a form of love that's everlasting. Not based on just feelings, but rather on a conscious decision to love God. It's that loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I believe I've read this around this building a few places. Love God, love people, change the world. Right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love people with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we'll change the world. Hmm. And that all starts with this one step that all of us have to make a decision about. Dwelling in the secret place and abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Worship team, come back, please. While they're coming, let me just make a couple more statements. 
I would believe that it was good for all of us to evaluate our relationship in Christ. I didn't say to Christ. I said evaluate our relationship in Christ. Every now and then I think we should do that. Maybe this morning is a good time for us to start that. I asked you this question at the very beginning of the message. Do you believe Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? If you do, I want you to stand with me. And as you stand where you are this morning, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, am I dwelling in the secret place? Am I living in a covenant relationship in Christ? Go ahead, right now, just say, Father, Holy Spirit, am I living in a covenant relationship in Christ? Holy Spirit, am I abiding under the shelter or the shadow of the Almighty in a vow to love Christ? Am I living in an agape covenant relationship in Christ? That, that's the questions to ask as you're standing before God right now. You can bow your heads. Just begin to say, God, Holy Spirit, am I? And you might say, well, why are you asking for the Holy Spirit's evaluation of our relationship in Christ? Because of this, we're being challenged every day by the devil to doubt his provisions, to doubt his plan, to doubt his purpose, and to doubt his power. And when or if we get to that place where we doubt that, then he is one. Can I say to you as you're standing here reverently before God and the Holy Spirit, don't let the devil in. Don't let him win. Declare to the devil, I know the word, and I stand upon it because I know his provisions, I know his promises, I know his plans, and I know that they are perfect. I would also believe this morning that there may be one or maybe more. And you are under attack of the enemy in your soul. You're in the midst of a battle. You may even feel like all the odds are against you. You might have even asked, God, where are you in the midst of this battle that I am? And maybe you even just feel this morning, Lord, if you would just hide me from the attack of the enemy. You know, Paul faced a battle and he prayed three times for God to take away that thorn, that attack in his flesh. And God said to him, my grace is sufficient. And God's grace is sufficient yesterday, today, and forever. This morning, if you still believe God's grace is sufficient, and yet you're in the midst of a battle, you're in the midst of the storm, you're, and it seems like the odds may be even against you, I want you to feel that freedom to come and stand down here in front of the church this morning. Come on, kick that devil off of your lap and say, I'm, I'm going to get what God's got for me this morning. I want you to come to the altars because they're a place that really is a place where we can come to dwell in his presence.